In this lecture, I want to talk about the stewardship of relationships. Um, now, because Christ has changed us, our character, our attitudes, our actions, we should become more Christ-like. Um, now, Christians are specifically called new creatures in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're no longer to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Um, we're now being led by the Spirit instead of by the flesh. And therefore, we are no longer to live according to the flesh. We're told repeatedly, put off the old man, and put on the new. Um, now, this affects our relationships because the world's plan for relationships is performance-based. In other words, my acceptance of you and your acceptance of me is based upon our respective performance. If you do your part, then I'll do mine. It, giving is based upon merit or earning. Affection is given only when one feels that it is deserved. Um, and so often motivations are based by feelings and what has the other person done. But this basis, performance-based relationships are doomed to failure. Why? Because of my inability to meet unreal expectations, the impossibility of knowing whether you've done enough um, or, or you haven't done your share. Uh, my tendency in such relationships is to focus on your weaknesses and failures of the other person uh, rather than on success and rather than on the other person. And my disappointment in the other person will tend to paralyze my performance. As a result, in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, Peter says that kind of a relationship leads to evil for evil and insult for insult. Um, and by the way, we talk about this in one of our lectures and in the book on biblical marriage and parenting because this principle goes to the heart of marriage, but it goes to the heart of any kind of relationship. Um, and so this ultimately is going to lead to unforgiving, hardened hearts. Um, and there's always going to be a tendency of people in such relationships to feel it necessary to get even uh, when a perceived slight occurs. Um, now, Christ's basis for relationships is completely different. It's grace-based, not performance-based. It's based on the nature of God himself. Um, and remember, Christ's love for us was based upon his pure grace. We did nothing and we could do nothing to earn our salvation. The Bible says when we were yet sinners, he died for us. So we can come to him with nothing but empty hands. And now, we are to be conformed into his image. We are to start treating people on the basis of grace, not on the basis of performance. Um, and we are to freely love. Love because he first loved us. We are to freely forgive because he first forgave us. Um, and in fact, when we understand this, we, we understand that particularly as Christians, we are members of one family now. Families always take care of each other, whether they've earned it or not. The fact that a person is failing or having difficulty is reason enough to want to help them. Um, and as a result, 1 Peter 3 goes on to say that instead of giving insult for insult or evil for evil, we should give a blessing instead. It's a blessing for evil, blessing for insult kind of relationship because that's exactly what Christ has done for us. And the whole point of our lives is to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, we are called as Christians uh, to love. As a matter of fact, the heart of Christianity in all Christ-based relationships is love. That is not true in Islam or any other religion. Um, but the reason why this is true is because God is love, according to 
1 Peter chapter 4. We are to be like him. And as I said, 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. You see, if we get these things deep into our heart and our mind, and we meditate upon them, we think about these things. That's why I said in terms of, uh, in, in an earlier lecture, uh, redemptive meditation. When we're reading the scripture, and we see God is love, and we love because he first loved us, and we consider some of these things, we need to be asking ourselves, all right, so what are the implications of this for my life? What are the implications of this for how I treat people? It, if it becomes a part of us, it will transform our relationships with other people. Now, you see, love is the primary test for whether a person has really been born again or not. How central is love to Christian relationships and to Christianity itself? Well, in your book I have, I list 15 ways. I won't read them all, but let's take a look at some of them. So central is love that Jesus said uh, that the entire Bible is based on two commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So central is love that 1 John 4 verse 8 says, the one who does not love does not know God. Um, and he goes on, uh, John, in 1 John 4 verse 20 to say that if someone says, I love God, but he does not love his neighbor, then he is a liar because it is impossible to love the God whom you have not seen if you don't love your neighbor whom you have seen. And the reason, I think, is very simple. Because, as we've seen, every human being is made in the image of God. And so how we treat God's image shows what we really think of God. Um, and so central is love that the goal of Christian teaching, according to 1 Timothy 1 verse 5, is, he says, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. So central is love that the entire law is fulfilled in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So central is love that on the night before he died, Jesus gave his disciples a new commandment. He said, a new commandment I give you. You shall love one another even as I have loved you. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So that is the test of our discipleship. That is the thing. Not your degree, not how much money you are have, not how successful you are, but your love is the test of whether you are really his disciple or not. Um, further, so central is love that in 1 Peter 4, verse 8, it says, fervent love for one another is to be shown above all. In other words, above everything else. Um, so central is love that James calls uh, it the royal law. Um, in John 15, verse 13, Jesus uh, said that the height of love is self-sacrifice. In other words, putting the interest of the other first when he said, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Um, and love is very practical. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 7, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. We need to think about and meditate on those verses. You know, if you're a pastor or a preacher, what do you emphasize in your sermons? Do you have a list of the sermons you've preached over the course of the last year? You should. You should know. Because love, practical love, is not just saying you love, but showing you love. Jesus, he said, love one another as I have loved you. How did he love people? Well, first, he loved them truly. He didn't just say he loved them. When people were hungry, he fed them. When people were sick, he healed them. Uh, he loved people equally. He didn't just love the Jews, but Jews and Gentiles. He didn't just love rich people. Rich, poor, men, women, old, young, beautiful, ugly, educated, uneducated. He loves us, and he loved us 
self-sacrificially. He gave everything he had for us um, because he did for us what we could never do for ourselves. Everything was practical. Everything was played out in life, not just lip service. And so that's what, why we need to meditate upon this. And that's why I'm saying love is the central thing. So how often do you preach on that? How often do you teach on that? How often do you give examples um, for how to love unlovable people? How do you love, uh, you know, the, the person next door who uh, she has two or three children, never has a moment to herself? Well, one way of loving, of course, is to say, listen, let me watch your kids uh, for the next couple of hours so you can go to the market or have some time for yourself. Um, I said in, in the case of uh, stewardship of the body. How do you show love? Well, digging pit latrines uh, for people. Or if someone has a house and the roof leaks, fixing the roof. I mean, practical ways of showing love. Why? Because we care. In the uh, lecture on stewardship of the environment, how do we show love? Look at all the trash all over uh, the villages and the towns. Why doesn't the church start cleaning it up? It shows that we care. We care about people's health. We care about the beauty. We care because we live here and you live there and we care about you. We love God and we love you. Love is practical. Practical. Think about these things. Meditate about these things. Then teach and demonstrate these things. Now, this leads to the next thing I want to say, and it flows from this, that how we treat people shows what we really think of God. And I mentioned that earlier. Uh, some Christians divide the sacred from the secular, but that's false. They think that what happens in church is spiritual, but how we treat people during the week is common. Totally false. James 1 verse 27 says this, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Now, the word for religion uh, is the Greek word uh, uh, threskia, which particularly refers to religious rites and ceremonies of religious worship. Everyone does rites and ceremonies. You know, some people cross themselves like that. Some people kind of kneel down when they uh, come into church. Uh, you know, some people raise their hands and so on. Those are all just rites and ceremonies, religious ceremonies. What James is saying is that doesn't really interest God. What interests him, true religion, the real religious ceremonies, is taking care of people with needs, widows and orphans, the most vulnerable people in society. That is true religion. Um, and being unstained by the world, by which he means no longer have the world's values and priorities. Um, we talked about that in our lecture on stewardship of the mind. We need to change, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we start thinking like Jesus. We start having Jesus's priorities. His values become our values. And then we start acting like Jesus acted. That is what is most important. How we treat people show what we really think of God because, as I said, people are made in the image of God and how we treat God's image shows what we really think of him. And, you know, Jesus said, the entire Bible comes down to two commandments, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And as John said in 1 John 4, verse 20, basically, it is how you do the second commandment, how you treat people, shows whether you're really doing the first commandment, loving God. Because if you say you love God, but you don't love your neighbor, you are a liar. This is very practical. How we treat people is spiritual at its core. How much do we emphasize this? I think a lot of churches, they emphasize things that are lesser important. We need to be emphasizing the things that are most important, uh, have God's priorities, so it gets deep into the hearts and minds of our people. Um, and so, you know, even when, when uh, in John 21, when after his death and resurrection, uh, John had a conversation with Peter. And three times he said, Peter, do you love me? And then 
Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus didn't just accept that. He said, oh, good, I'm glad to know that. He said, no, Peter, feed my sheep. Uh, Peter, do you love me? Tend my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I do. Well, then feed my sheep. What he was saying was, um, what you do, taking care of my people, that's the proof of whether you really love me or not. It is how you treat people. Um, so, uh, you know, according to uh, James 1 verse 27, and I have a number of other scriptures that I list in the book here, it's what, how we do what God says is more important than our formal acts of worship. Jesus said, the sign that we truly love him is if we do what he says. He said that in John 14, verses 15, 21, and 23. The primary sign of our faithfulness to God is how we treat people. But on the other hand, the primary sign of our lack of faith and our disobedience to God is how we treat people. So, we need to understand what we do in this life, especially how we treat people, will be the standard by which we are judged at the final judgment. Now, we can't work our way to heaven by doing good deeds, but as one writer put it, works are an index of the spiritual condition of a person's heart. Um, and so, the, at the judgment, you know, the, the Bible repeatedly says that God will reward people according to their deeds. Um, and that's why James says, some may well say, you have faith and I have works. Well, show me your faith without the works. I will show you my faith by my works. Uh, for just as a body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. And again, the primary thing is how we treat people. You look at uh, the, the judgment, the, the sheep and the goats. Jesus said, one day everyone will stand in front of me as a sheep or a goat. And I'll say to the goats, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was sick and in, and in prison, you didn't visit me. And when I was a stranger, you didn't take me in. What do the goats say? They say, when? When did we see you? If we'd have seen you, Jesus, we'd have done these things. But Jesus says, what you did not do to the least of these, you didn't do to me. Go to hell. To the sheep, he says, when I was naked, you clothed me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was sick and in prison, you visited me. And when I was a stranger, you took me in. What do the sheep say? They say the same thing the goat said. When? When did we see you? But Jesus says, what you did do to the least of these, you did to me. Now, both groups could call Jesus Lord. And we know unsaved people can call him Lord because in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, Jesus says, on that day, the day of judgment, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, look at all I've done uh, for you. And he says, I never knew you. Go to hell. But the difference between the sheep and the goats was the goats, they could call him Lord, but it never penetrated. Their faith never penetrated. So it didn't change their action. It didn't change their attitudes. It didn't change their priorities. It didn't change how they treated people in need. But the faith of the sheep did. It penetrated. So they started naturally doing the things that Jesus did. Um, in other words, their new nature in Christ became second nature. Just like Jesus, they didn't have to think about it. When they saw a need, they were filled with love and compassion, just as Jesus is filled with love and compassion to us. Um, and they acted accordingly. You see, it's relationships. God by being Trinity, is relational at his core. And so we are to be relational beings, knowing that how we treat people has tremendous spiritual significance. It's the difference between life and death because it reveals whether we have true saving faith or not. Um, now, basic priority list. Number one, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Well, we, if we do that, we need to maintain ourselves as an example of godliness. We need to plan our time. We need to recognize our limitations. We need to say no to excessive demands. We need to do the things we've talked about in prior lectures. But 
then, insofar as our relationships with other people is concerned, our own family is a higher priority than those outside the family, even than your church, because we are not even qualified to be leaders in the church if we cannot maintain our household well, according to 1 Timothy 3, verses 4 and 5. Now, your spouse is to be your first priority, since he or she is one flesh with you. Your children are the second priority, and you and your spouse's parents and other family members are the third priority. Now, some people, uh, well, your neighbors and those outside your family, in other words, those in your community, are the next priority. Why? Because, again, to be a leader in the church, we have to maintain a good reputation with those outside the church. And then fourth, or fifth, the church is important, but we're only qualified to serve in the church if we first have our other priorities in proper alignment. Unfortunately, I know many pastors and church leaders, they are first wedded to their church, and then comes the wife and kids and others. They have things exactly backwards. If that's the way they act, they're not qualified. I knew a pastor here where I live. He had problems with his wife, largely because of how he treated her. And he was given time off to try and get his marriage in order. He did not do that. But he said, if it comes down to a choice between my church and my wife, I choose the church. That man was not qualified to be a pastor or a leader in the church. We need to get things in proper alignment. Now, I want to conclude this lecture by talking about practical ways to demonstrate love. We talk about this in our uh, book and in the video lectures on uh, biblical marriage and parenting. This is what is known as the five love languages, five universal ways which people show love and receive or experience love. There are five basic ways, and this goes across cultures everywhere in the world. The first are words of affirmation, words that build up, compliment, encourage, are one way to express love. And so we need to give our spouse and other people words of affirmation, uh, words of encouragement that are showing, I know, I care, I'm with you, I will be with you, I can help. Um, and these need to be said with kindness and tenderness. The second universal way is quality time. It refers to giving someone your undivided, focused attention. Um, it can include looking at each other. It, it, you know, my wife and I, uh, I, I think I said in an earlier lecture, she gets home at night and we love then to eat together, shut off the computers, shut off the other things, spend time together. Sometimes we may go for a walk together around our block. It only takes five minutes. Uh, but I know a lot of people, husbands and wives in East Africa, don't like to walk together or hold hands. I mean, there are different ways. Just show, spend time, get to know your spouse, get to know other people. That's how we become friends. Third, giving and receiving gifts. Um, you know, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Um, we need to know what our spouse or those we care about, the kind of things they like. Just don't give them the kind of gift that you want. Know the person. It shows you care. The fourth is acts of service, namely doing things that the other person would like. Um, for example, a um, friend of mine lives in an area in Uganda uh, where culturally the wife is supposed to gather the firewood. But my friend typically gathers the firewood. Why? Because he loves his wife. He wants to show, I love you. Um, and so I will do this. And it's a joy. And let me say, that's acting counterculturally. But there's no such thing as the culture police that will come knocking on your door saying, why are you doing this? Um, you know, every family has certain, uh, you know, this person normally does this, another person does the other thing. Sometimes do the other person's thing just because it's a way of saying, I care about you. It's not limited to husbands and wives. It's about people you care about. And so the fourth or the fifth is physical touch. Um, 
the kind of thing, you know, it, it can just be stroking her hair or her face or just putting a hand on the shoulder. Our bodies are filled with touch receptors, and that shows very much that we care. Um, so we, I talk more about this in the book and in our book on biblical marriage and parenting, but again, these are five universal ways that people show love and experience love. Words of affirmation, quality time, giving and receiving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. And you should know, everybody has a, a different primary uh, one. You know, most people have a primary and maybe a secondary, but one or two of these that are more important. So for in, in my case, with my wife, quality time is probably our most important one. For me, getting gifts is low on the scale. It might be different for you. Um, words of affirmation may be most important. Um, and, you know, you hear those things, it can lift you up. So get to know the people. Um, and I give some details in the book that I haven't got time to talk about now, but take a look at the book to help you think about these things and start applying them because we are relational at our core because God is relational at our core, at his core. Love is the heart and soul of Christianity. And how we treat people shows what we really think of God. And ultimately, what we do will be the standard that shows whether we are really saved or not. These things are of tremendous importance. We need to spend time preaching and teaching, and most importantly, modeling these things for our people so that they see how real Christians live and treat others. God bless you.